Good morning. We are going to get this going. We are coming to an end of our series, and you know, this has been one of the weirdest series I have ever done. You're thinking, why has this been a weird series? Well, I'll tell you why. It's been a weird series, and I don't know what it is, but I can't wait to be done preaching this series. This is just driving me crazy. I don't particularly like it, and it's not because I don't like conflict resolution. It's just because I think maybe it's because my speaking style, I like to be like more evangelistic in nature, and this just doesn't lend to that very well. And so I'm just really not enthused or excited about preaching on this every week, But every time I say that to somebody, they're like, what? No, this has been so good. It's a great series. So I'll have to to, uh, submit to your opinion and to your authority and and praise the Lord, and uh, we'll continue on. But I do believe it's possible there will be two more installments, but I do believe that there will only be one more installment in the series after this one, and we'll be done and moving on to something else. So having said that, if there's something that you guys want to hear about, if there's a question or a topic in the Bible you want to know about... Let me know, and we'll see what we can do about that. All right, so moving on into our series now, into our meeting today. So far, we've learned that there's four Gs of resolving conflict to biblically resolve conflict, and that we've learned through our series that there's pragmatic lessons, pragmatic tips that we can take away, and that we can use for resolving conflict in a way that brings glory to God and can restore our relationships with others, right? And along the pathway, we've also learned that if there is a separation in a relationship between somebody else here on this level, then there's a separation between us and God on this level, right? They go hand in hand. God doesn't want us to be divided from another brother or sister in this world. He wants us to be united, and he wants us to do everything we can to restore that relationship and to resolve any conflict or division in that relationship, all right? So we've learned so far to do that, that there's different responses, and we've been over this several times, so I'll just say again, we want to be in the peacemaking responses, and those are to overlook, to reconcile, to negotiate if possible, mediate, arbitrate, and accountability, and of course, arbitration is done in a biblical manner. All right, so these are the responses, and then we've looked at the four Gs of resolving conflict, and we've exhaustively looked at glorifying God, we've exhaustively looked at getting the log out of our own eye, and we started yesterday, gently rest- I'm sorry, last week with gently restore, and now we're in a gently restore part two. And the reason why we're in gently restore part two is because last week we looked at what our responsibility is in gently restoring a brother or a sister if they have offended us. But sometimes a personal effort is not enough. Sometimes just one personal discussion or many personal discussions or private discussions does not resolve the conflict, and there may come a time where the church must get involved. And that's what we're going to look at today. And I want, I want to answer two questions looking at this. Number one, is there a time that the church should get involved? And number two, if the church does get involved, What is my responsibility with that, especially if the church is involved because of something I've done wrong? Those are the two questions that I really want to look at and focus on today and try to answer through this, all right? So let's move on to, um, I'm sorry, and last week, uh, I'm sorry, so here are four principles for generally, or five principles, (laughs) these, I'm really struggling. These are the five principles we looked at at gently restoring, right? Number one, restoring means more than confronting. Number two, sooner or later, face to face. Number three, if someone has something against you. Number four, when someone's sins are too serious to overlook. And number five, we looked at special considerations for restoring a conversation or restoring a conflict with somebody, resolving an issue in a relationship with somebody. We looked at the special considerations to concern. The reason why I highlighted number one, though, why do you think I highlighted the first step? Because why? It's the most important. It's the most important. Brothers and sisters, I can't emphasize this enough. If this is not your intent when you go to restore a confrontation, if this is not your intent when you go to resolve an offense or an issue with somebody else, chances are the resolution is not going to come. It's not going to come. Chances are, unless you're dealing with a very mature Christian, it's just going to add to the conflict. And you could hear some of the responses when I told the children's story today. When that guy was just wanting me to call the boss because he was concerned about his own, his own hide, his own, his own welfare, 
It didn't make others, including myself, feel good, right? And if you're in a conflict with somebody and that's all you're concerned about is just confronting them and getting the anger off of your chest and having a chance to, to exude some righteous anger, it's not going to help you. And in fact, it's going to bring shame and dishonor to God and probably not yourself. So I would suggest to you that you take a lot of time praying about this one right here before you go to these ones right here. Amen? All right. So uh, then we looked at some principles to keep in mind for special considerations. And those considerations were going to non-Christians. We had to, to take that into account. Remember that non-Christians are not held to the same standard that we are, and they're held to a different form of government than we are. When you become a Christian, whether you like it or not, your government becomes the church. That is God's highest government for you. It is not your country. It is not in your family, nothing else. It is the church. The church becomes the highest form of government. Now, I want to say a caveat, and we're going to look at that as we go through the series. So bear with me on that statement, but I'm going to show you exactly how much that means to Jesus Christ. All right? So keep that thought as we go through the series. But going to non-Christians is a special consideration. Going to a person in authority, dealing with abuse, going tentatively and repeatedly, remember, we're going to assume the best and we're going to continually go to that person to make sure our communication wasn't misconstrued. And then after the log is out of your own eye, take care of your own issues before you go try to help somebody else with theirs, right? All right, so we also learned that none of these excuse us from letting conflict go unresolved, and we mu but we must take extra precautions when we're dealing with these. So what is the excuse for letting conflict go? I hear a couple muffled answers, but nothing loud enough to get up here. So either the mask or something is, is covering the volume, or you don't have the confidence to spit it out in an aggressive way. Yes, go ahead. I think maybe you have to get yourself prepared and conditioned in your mind and ask God how to tell you. Okay, that is a very good step, and that must take place, but that does not excuse you from overlooking an offense. Okay? You still have to go and talk to them, but you should do that first, so I'm glad that you said that. All right, let's go over here, and then we'll come back here. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, what you're, I think what you're saying is that uh, we don't want to get involved in a conflict because it might lead to more conflict um, and no solutions or resolutions for the conflict, right? So we might up the degree of the conflict. Okay, so uh, that is true, but that is not an excuse for, over, for, for overlooking a conflict. Go ahead. Okay, so I think what Antonio is saying, thank you, um, I'm going to summarize what you said um, in a little bit different way, and just in language that I've used in the series, but that, that was correct. And the thing is, the only way that we can overlook a conflict or not address a conflict is if it is a conflict that we can overlook, right? If it is an offense that can be overlooked, and there is an easy barometer for knowing if you can overlook an offense or not, and that is, once you've decided to overlook it, if it leaves your mind. If it doesn't leave your mind, if it stays with you, if you keep on dwelling upon it, then it's not an offense that you can overlook. You must go talk about it. But if it is an offense you can overlook, then you don't have to go and resolve a conflict. That is the only excuse for not taking enough care of an offense. Now, brothers and sisters, listen. I just want to be honest up here, okay? Just because I have this information doesn't mean I don't struggle with the same emotions and the same excuses that you guys struggle with, all right? We're all in this together, Oftentimes, we would like to avoid conflict because we don't want to bring it up. Oftentimes, what we end up doing in our passive-aggressive nature is not going to the person about it, but venting to all of our friends and our family about the issue. And doing that brings dishonor to God. It doesn't help. It doesn't resolve the conflict. It doesn't bring honor to God. He says in Matthew 18, if your brother has offended you, go and talk to him privately. 
Now, if we were talking about the the fourth commandment in this church, right, how many of you would say it's a big issue whether you worship on Saturday or Sunday? Raise your hands if you think that'd be a big issue. In this church, we say that's a huge issue, right? We say it really matters, and we say you must do what God's asking you to do. Amen? And how many of you think that you must keep the commandments of God? Raise your hand if you think that God's expecting you to do that. So when God, Jesus himself, tells us you must go to your brother and talk to them and fix this problem, or if you know somebody's offended with you, drop your gift at the altar and go talk to them, how important do you think it is to Jesus that we do this? It's important. It's not okay to continue our passive aggressiveness and just to ignore something that's eating us up at side or eating somebody else up. We must take care of that issue in a way that we can. If it can't be resolved, well, that's between God and that person. But your responsibility is to do your effort. You understand? And I'm going to tell you something else. It might be very uncomfortable, but it will lead to stronger relationships and it will lead to a better church. All right, so I'm done preaching it, you know. All right, let's move on. So I had a friend that I was working with. I won't tell you where, but I had a friend I was working with, and he recently had gotten married. He got married to this girl that he had met, and this marriage came together very quickly, within like a month, very quickly, a month quick type thing. This marriage came together very quickly, and I knew that my friend was going to struggle with this woman. And the reason why I knew my friend was going to struggle with this woman is because my friend was extremely chauvinistic, all right? By nature, so chauvinistic, and not only chauvinistic by nature, but very selfish by nature, all right? Only child, very spoiled, chauvinistic, and needed to grow before they got married. That would be my, my judgment. This woman happened to have a strong personality. I wouldn't say that she was a bad woman in any way. I'm just saying that she happened to have a strong personality. She had a sense of independence, and she had a strong, um, a strong enough personality that she was going to defend that sense of independence and defend herself and speak up when she felt that she was being wrong. And so if you put these two together, what do you think is going to happen? There's going to be conflict at some point. Well, it took about a week, and there was serious conflict in that marriage. About one week, I got a phone call, and this friend of mine was demanding that we take his wife up in front of the church and discipline her in front of everybody for not being a good wife. (laughs) Now, I can tell by your responses that you flushed out And you see immediately what's wrong with an idea like this, right? So this was a very easy illustration. This was a very easy example for us to look at and say, that is not what Matthew 18 is about. That is not what the church is here for. And brothers and sisters, you are absolutely correct. And that is what I told my friend. I said, that is not the way you deal with this, all right? You better handle this another direction, All right, but let's look at Matthew 18 and get some principles for involving the church in gently restoring. Let's look at some principles and see what Matthew 18 says. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, we've already looked at verse 15. We've already looked at our responsibility for going and talking to somebody, so I'm not going to go there again. But what do you do after a personal visit doesn't work? What do you do if you need more of a personal visit? Well, the first principle that we need to understand is from this passage that Jesus has given to us is that privacy is the utmost importance in this. Privacy is the key word. Even if you have to involve others, you need to do it in as private matter as you possibly can. Jesus has not left room for us in telling everybody about it. 
Jesus has not left room for us to go around gossiping and destroying somebody's character because they are offending us or they have wronged us, even if they're in the wrong. Privacy is the main con, the main principle of this chapter. The second thing I want to talk about is if someone tries to say to us that there's never a need for church discipline or for the church to get involved, according to Jesus, they're just plain wrong. There are times where the church must get involved. It is a church duty. It is a duty of the church given to us by God himself, a responsibility that the church must get involved in at times. Now, nobody wants to get involved with this. And if you have a group of leaders that are trying to get involved and always want to get involved, I would suggest to you that you need to replace those leaders with those who don't want to, right? But you need to replace them with those who just don't want to, with those who don't want to, but will do what God's responsibility for them is. Amen? All right. So, um, with these important principles in mind, let's look at five, five steps to guide us through this reconciliation process. Five steps to guide us through after personal attempts have been tried and have failed. Steps to gently restoring. Number one, overlook minor offenses. Number two, talk in private. Number three, take one or two others along. Number four, tell it to the church. Excuse me. Number five, tell them as a non, or treat them as a non-believer. So these are the five steps that Jesus gives us for gently restoring in Matthew 18. Now, I'm not going to cover number one again because we've already covered it, right? However, you can over, um, if you can overlook an offense, you should do so. It's recommended in the Bible, Proverbs 19.11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a what? A transgression. We bring glory to God when we overlook offenses. Now, again, if you have been hurt deeply by somebody and you decide to overlook that offense and you continue dwelling upon it after you've decided to overlook that offense, that is not one that you can overlook. That is one that you have to handle. That is one that you have to process. You understand? Okay? But if you can overlook it, if you can get over it, if you can move on with life, it doesn't bother you, it brings glory to God to do so. All right? But if you can't, you'll have to go and seek reconciliation. Step number two, talk in private. Now, we've dealt with this concept a lot. The less people that know about someone's fault, the better. Nobody likes it when everybody knows their business. First Peter tells us in 2.1, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. What does slander mean? Basically, it means to tear down somebody's character. It means to tear down somebody's character. Now, you don't have to be lying about somebody to tear down their character. You can be telling the truth, and it's still slander, all right? At the minimum, it's gossip. There's a lady that lives in southwest Michigan, and I wish I could just destroy her character right now because that's all she does, but I'm not going to. There's this lady that lives in southwest Michigan, all right? And she goes around to every single place to place to place to place, and she'll take her turns. She'll bring up everybody. My name has been brought up in many different conversations. Other people's names have been brought up in many different conversations, all these things. And she gets on the phone, or she'll meet you in person, and everybody knows what her aim is as soon as they come. And most people I know try to avoid her. If they see her coming, they hide, they duck, they run, they get away, right? You ever close the curtains when a guest comes or get really quiet? That's what happens when this one comes around, okay? Okay? So I'm not saying that's right or wrong. You guys make your own conclusions. Anyways, so this person comes and they gossip. And when you bring up the point, listen, you are gossiping about somebody. I'm not gossiping because I'm only telling the truth. Yes, but what do I have to do with this person? Am I in a position to help them? Am I in a position that I can go and counsel them? Am I in a position that I can bring resolution to a problem that's taking place? No. And if I'm not, then you are gossiping whether you're telling the truth or not. You're gossiping. If you go to somebody and tell them even the truth about somebody's character, if they're not in a situation where they can help that person or if they're not in a situation where they're affected by that person's offense, you're gossiping. All right? That doesn't help this matter at all. That will only bring more problems. All right? So even if you have to use intermediaries also... I'm sorry. Even if you have to use intermediaries, you still need to resolve this. 
And eventually, you'll have to talk to that person face-to-face for full disclosure. So um, when we talk about talk in private, that's what we're talking about. That even, even if you have to use mediator, intermediaries or a mediator, if you will, it needs to be done as in a private way as possible. But if intermediaries are involved, and we looked at special considerations, especially when abuse is involved, then um, you, you still will need to talk to them face-to-face to have full closure. All right, step number three, take one or two others along. Now we are to the part on what we do if we go privately and the person won't turn away from their sin or acknowledge it, then according to Jesus, you need to take two or three others with you who can help you, all right? We are not going to take two or three others with us just to document our side. We're going to take people with us that can actually help, all right? So what people do you think we're looking for? Well, they should be non-biased, yes, but a lot of that is your, your, the way you're representing. If you don't tell them anything, they'll definitely be non-biased. If you tell them your side of the story before they get there, you might create biases. But these should be people of authority. All right? That's why Jesus says, take two or three elders with you. All right? When we're talking in the concept of the church, they should be elders, right? leaders of the church. If they're not an elder or a leader, it should be a very respected individual in the church. You understand. That's what Jesus is saying, all right? And yes, they should be unbiased. You're very true, right? If it's out in the community, if it's at large with with the community at large, then you're going to have to take authority figures with you. And you guys can find those authority figures. Maybe it is uh, a very good family friend, that is familiar to both of you, or maybe it's a, very, a family member that's familiar to both of you. You know, maybe it's, you know, a policeman or something, you understand, but they need to be people of authority in some way, shape, or form, all right? That has to be done because if it's not done, there'll be no respect, right? It'll just be you finding somebody on your side, all right? So Paul confirms what Jesus is saying in Philippians 2 and 3, Philippians 4, 2 and 3. Philippians 4, 2 through 3, I entreat Eudeus and I entreat Suntiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Apparently, these two were having a disagreement that they couldn't work out by themselves. So Paul recommended that the brothers in Philippi get involved to help them. So how does this work? How does it work when the person won't listen to us in private conversation and now we have to invite involve others, a couple others, two or three others, to come and help resolve the situation. Sand gives us some counsel, and Peacemakers, page 187. In some cases, the others may serve as intermediaries, shut, shutting, a shuttling between both sides to promote understanding. In most cases, however, they will act initially as mediators, meeting with both parties simultaneously to improve communication and offer biblical counsel. If necessary, they may, may eventually serve as arbitrators arbitrators and provide a binding decision about how to resolve the matter. So in most cases, when somebody else gets involved, they start out as a mediator. But then usually when it's come to the spot where we have to get others involved, their role of mediation becomes a role of arbitration, and they have to deal out counsel. All right, now this brings us to a couple interesting questions. These are the questions that we must consider. Is our citizenship in the church more important than our citizenship in our country? First consideration we need to consider. Is our citizenship in the church more important than our citizenship in the country? Number two, are we subject to the leaders of our church according to Jesus? Does Jesus tell us that we're subject to the leaders of our church? This point seems to be drawn out not only in Matthew 18, but also in 1 Corinthians 6. So let's go there now. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And we're trying to answer the questions, is our citizen in the, citizenship in the church more important than our citizenship with our country? And number two, we're trying to answer the question, does Jesus put us under the authority of church leaders? Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Verse, chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between he and his brethren. But brother, go be, but brother goes to the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore... There is utterly a fault among you because you go to the law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Let's break this down. Paul says, why are you taking matters to non-believers? It needs to be handled where? In the church. He said, you defraud your brothers, you defraud your sisters, you defraud God when you take your matters to non-believers. He says, it needs to be handled in the church. There's got to be somebody in the church that can judge righteously this situation. And in so doing... Jesus says that our greater responsibility of citizenship is to the church than to our country. Because Paul says, even if you have to sacrifice yourself to make sure that the debate, the argument, doesn't go between non-believers, you should do so. Now, we've talked about that a lot, and I'm going to throw in a caveat here in just a second because I know some of you have this question. But number one, I just want to remind you really quick. If a brother has offended you, if a brother has taken from you, if a sister has hurt you, if a sister has maybe even taken property, because this passage is talking more than just about personal issues. It's talking about material issues as well. If somebody has done something like that and you have had to sacrifice for the cause of God, you can be sure of this principle that God is going to restore. God will take care of that and God will restore and he will honor your faith and he will honor your sacrifice. All right, But be sure that he's saying that he's asking us to do that. Now, here's the biggest caveat that needs to be made here. That is this. Jesus is the only real judge. What did I say? Jesus is the only real judge. He makes that clear in John 5, 22, and he says, all judgment has been given to the Son. So whatever judgment we make, it's only binding if it's in harmony with God's will. All right? Whatever judgment the church leaders make, whatever judgment the church makes, it's only in harmony if it's in, I mean, it's only binding if it's in harmony with God's will. And ultimately, Jesus will judge that and not the church leaders and not you. Ultimately, Jesus is going to judge that because he takes all judgment for himself. However, it does seem that Jesus is saying there is certainly an element of submitting to the direction of the church. Now, this has been used terribly long, wrong throughout history, and that is not what I'm talking about here. But Paul is saying that Christians should be able to judge Christians. Christians and that we should accept that judgment and not allow non-believers to judge us. It should be taken care of in the church. Of course, that means that where once someone was a mediator, they may be quickly become an arbitrator. Where once they were trying to develop communication on both sides, there may come a time where that mediator now has to become an arbitrator and, 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 and bring a solution for reconciliation. All right? Now, involving mediators and possibly arbitrators can be done in one of two ways. So when we elicit help, number one, it can be done by mutual agreement. Now, this is always going to be the best way. It's always going to be the easiest way. It's always going to be the most efficient way. If both parties or all parties involved in the conflict agree to, to, to help, um, that's going to be the easiest way. But if someone won't agree to this, you have a biblical right, according to Jesus, to initiate a mediator or an arbitrator to help find, to help find resolution for your problem. If you are initiating this on your own accord without the agreement from the one or ones you are in dispute with, make sure that you document everything. What did I say? Document everything. If the other party won't agree to having somebody else get involved, and you're initiating that, you make sure that you document 
everything. So they will not feel like you are misrepresenting the conflict, or if they do, you will have written documentation of all of your actions. Sand gives a great example on how to proceed with this course of action. If you have to initiate this on your own, Sand gives a great example of a Christian brother who had a problem with another Christian brother who did this in a proper manner, in a biblical way. Here's a letter that is in this book, Peacemakers. Dear Pastor Smith, I am involved in a dispute with John Jones, who I believed is a member of your church. John and I have not been able able to resolve this matter in private because I want to follow God's instruction in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8 and Matthew 18, 15 through 20 I would deeply appreciate it if you or another leader in your church would be willing to meet with us and help us come to an agreement in fairness to John, I will not go into any detail about the dispute in this letter other than to say it involves John's, it involves John's purchase of a business of mine I will wait until he and I are with you so you can hear both sides or both of our perspectives at the same time. If you or one of the leaders in your church would be willing to help us resolve this matter, I would be able to meet with you and John any evening during the next few weeks. One of the elders from my church would be willing to meet with us as well. I know you have many other things to do, and I regret having to burden you with this request, but in interest of peace and unity amongst Christians, I don't feel I can leave matters unresolved between John and me. I would deeply appreciate your assistance. By the way, I have sent a copy of this letter to John so he knows what I have communicated to you. If you have to initiate it, this is a very good way to initiate involving other people. Document it, send a letter to everybody that you wish to get involved, the same letter so everybody knows, and then you can show everybody how you went wrong with this. If you don't follow this step, if you don't document it, you are leaving yourself wide open to many different accusations. So make sure that you document it. All right. While initiating the involvement of others to help do so, so document it while initiating it, uh, and and, and um, make sure, again, make sure this can't be said enough, make sure that your desire is to restore and not just to get your way. Step number four, after you've done these others, after you've taken two or three others along, if they haven't listened, you must tell it to the church. All right? So after you've brought church leaders with you to reconcile, but there's still no reconciliation, then according to Matthew 18, Jesus teaches us to take it to the church. Matthew 18, 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, those are very strong words, just so you know. If the offending party still refuses to make right after discussion between you and them privately, after they've refused to make right after the discussion between the church elders and them privately, then it goes before the church. If they refuse to listen to the decision of the church, unfortunately, more will have to be done. And we are not going to get into church discipline because we know that this is not a good thing. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today, but Jesus is clearly teaching that all of us are subject to the church in a big capacity. There is an exception to being subject to the church, of course, and that exception is here. So they called them, Acts chapter 4, 18 through 20, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be judged, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. The Jewish leaders brought the apostles in before them and said, you must quit telling people about Jesus. And Peter says, listen, whether you think that's right or wrong, we don't know, but we're going to follow God and not you. You understand? We are subject to the authority of the church unless they are violating the principles of God, unless they are asking you to do something that is out of harmony with God's will. Now, I, know, I want to pause here. I know that this concept can be very uncomfortable. It can be very uncomfortable to think that the church has this kind of authority and that you're supposed to subject yourself to them. But I want to say this, the church is a family, and the church's job is to bring us into a relationship with who? Jesus. Jesus. That's the church's job. If it escalates to a point where the church needs to get involved, 95% of the time, maybe 99% of the time, 
you're already separated from God. You're already in serious trouble. And if you're not subjecting yourself to the authority of the church, you're not subjecting yourself to the authority of God. All right? The church is not the one who's pushing you into being separated from God. You've already separated yourself from God, and the church is just now getting to the point where they recognize that. That's really what this is. This is not the church trying to hurt you. This is the church trying to redeem you. When it gets to this point, this is supposed to be redemptive. Now remember, I'm not teaching that the church delivers final judgment. That belongs to Jesus. But Jesus wants us to be in subjection to the church, and according to 1 Corinthians 6, that not only refers to personal issues, but also material issues. The last step I want to look at in gently restoring is number five, treat them as a non-believer. It's important to remember two very important principles here. This is not the desired outcome in any circumstance. The desired outcome is always what? Reconciliation to restore brother, right? So if it gets to this point, this means that something very bad has happened, right? And the church should be grieving. Number two, this is not my opinion. This concept is clearly taught in the Bible. This comes from Jesus himself. This does not come from your pastor. This does not come from somebody looking for, you know, some kind of leadership role or some kind of power. This is coming from Jesus. He's the one who gives this counsel, not us. Matthew 18, 17 through 20. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will be done for them in my, by, the, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Again, we see this concept in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5.20, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. And when Paul was dealing with an issue of sin in Corinth, he counseled the church to put the member out of the church as well. 1 Corinthians 5.2, And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. This is a principle taught all through the New Testament. If they refuse to listen to the church, if they refuse to change their ways, you'd put them out of the church. Now, great caution needs to be taken when conflict reaches this point. There are two traps that the church can fall into when it comes to this kind of church discipline. There are two traps the church can fall into, all right? Here they are. Councils for the Church, page 255. In dealing with erring members, God's people are carefully to follow the instruction given by the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Human beings are Christ's property, purchased by him at an infinite price, bound to him by the love that he and his Father have manifested for them. How careful, then, we should be in our dealing with another. How careful should we be in dealing with another, remembering that that brother or sister that we're talking about was purchased by the most precious element in the universe. They were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for that brother or sister. How careful should we be when we are dealing with that brother or sister? Great thought, she says, must be considered before taking this step. Now, I'm talking to our church leaders right now over this, especially. They should really be listening to this. The second, is, the second trap that we fall in is this one. Same book, Councils for the Church, page 241. Same author. The word of God does not give license for one man to set up his judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church. Neither is he allowed to urge his opinions against the opinions of the church. If there were no church discipline in government, the church would go to fragments. The reason why Jesus gave us this concept is because if it didn't have it, if we didn't have this concept, the church would break apart, it would dissolve, it'd be fragmented, it would lose its power and its ability to spread the gospel to the world. 
to spread the gospel to the community. And that's why he gives it to us. The two traps that a church can fall into when it comes to Matthew 18 and dealing with an Aryan brother is number one, not doing anything. And number two, being too rash or hasty in the situation. If the church gets involved, they don't have to make their decision overnight. It may take them months to figure out the best way to resolve that issue, and that's okay. We are dealing with somebody who was brought by the precious blood of Jesus, and that makes them priceless no matter what they've done. But if we do nothing, not only will it cause harm to the church and its effectiveness and its ability to reach the community, but it will cause harm to the person who's offending. It will cause harm to the person who's fallen to sin. You understand. And that's why Jesus has given us this duty. Now I'm going to pause right here for just a second. Because this is our duty. Number one, you should never covet wanting to be an elder. Because I can tell you right now what it's like to go into somebody's house and have to do this. It's very uncomfortable. It's very unpleasant. It's not fun. You're going to get every name calling at you. You're going to get all sorts of emotions. And you understand that you don't want to be there, but you have to be there. Number two, if you don't go there, that brother or sister may be lost. They, not, they might not make it to heaven. Now again, please understand that I'm saying that in the context of Jesus is the judge and not the church. Okay? I am not the judge. I didn't die for that person. Jesus did. But I'm saying we can all look at somebody's life and see if they're living in harmony with God's will or not. I mean, we can't all do that, but I'm, there are certain circumstances where we can do that, right? It doesn't take a sharp eye. It doesn't take a lot of discernment to see if somebody is abusing another individual that they're not in harmony with God's law. They're not in harmony with God's principles. And unless they stop and repent of their course of action, they're not going to be in heaven. All right? It's very easy to point that out. Now, there's other things that we could go into, and that's where careful thought comes into. But I'm just saying, the church has only recognized what God is already showing us. It means it's gotten to the point where it couldn't be concealed anymore, and that's why the church is involved. When Matthew 18 is followed correctly, it can be a great tool to build strength and to make your church a redeeming church. And that's the point of the church. We are a family. We are a family. Jesus wants us to be a family. He wants this place, the Mile Seventh-day Adventist Church, to be a, a hospital for sinners. And at times, the church may need to bring in a triage unit and treat some gross offense. But if it's done properly, not only will they redeem the individual that committed the offense, but they will build the church and strengthen it and the family will become more united and stronger in the process. If we follow Matthew 18 correctly, that is the ultimate goal. That is the aim that Jesus is looking for. Jack was a medical student in college and he was a church leader. He was going to medical school in, in, in college, and he was a rising star in the church. He had, he had talents and attributes that lend themselves to the ministry, and he was using those talents and attributes to the ministry. He had a small study, a, a small study Bible group uh, in his house that he was leading others to Jesus, but Jack had a problem. Jack was addicted to alcohol, and he was addicted to lust. Jack was a drunk womanizer, when he was not in the church. Jack got outed because he was inviting a non-Christian woman to his small group, but instead of studying the Bible with her, he was inviting her into his bedroom. And the only reason why the church found out about Jack's transgressions is because the woman became converted and repented of her sins to those helping her become baptized, those helping her to get baptized. And when the pastor found out about this, he had the uncomfortable 
responsibility to confront Jack about what he was doing. And he remembers the conversation well. He had a meeting between Jack and himself, and when that got nowhere, he involved the elders in Jack. And in a private manner, in their own study, he brought Jack in, and on a whiteboard, he made him write down the names of the women he had slept with in the past year. There were six of them. As he's trying to be a Bible, give Bible studies and represent Jesus. When Jack finally came clean, they made him confess his sins to the board and pledge to follow a covenant of mentoring and strict boundaries on his life that would restrict his activities and try to kill the sin that Jack was addicted to. Jack eventually moved from the church. A year later, his job took him away from that church. But Jack had the amazing integrity to tell the new pastor of the new church he had found a home with of his church discipline that he was under. And the new pastor called the old pastor and he said, hey, Jack told me he had this problem and the pastor sent him, with Jack's permission, a letter of the covenant that the elders drafted to help Jack kill his sin. And the new pastor mentored Jack and they followed, continued in this covenant. Six years later, Providence brought Jack back to that town on a visit, and he went to that church to visit the pastor. And when he saw the pastor, he immediately embraced him, and he introduced him to his wife and his three kids, his new family that he had. And he said, Pastor, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, you know, for, well, everything you did. At times, it was very humbling for me to do what you made me do. At times, it was very humiliating to do what you were asking of me. And I'll admit it, at times, I even hated you. But thank you for persevering. God has given me victory, and now I have a happy wife and three happy children that I'm raising to the glory of God. And if you had not have intervened, I don't know if I'd still be here today. When church discipline is done correctly, it redeems individuals and it makes the church stronger. I don't know even what to appeal on. I just know that every discourse should have an appeal according to Spirit of Prophecy. So my appeal is this. Number one, do you guys see in the Bible that Jesus is asking us in some degree to subject ourselves to the authority of the church? Is that clear? Is it clear to you that through the Bible teachings that Jesus at times, as a last resort, after great care and consideration has been taken, the church must act and enforce some sort of discipline between erring brothers? Is it clear in the Bible? Is it your desire to covet to the authority of the church and to doing what you can to help resolve your brothers' and sisters' issues? Father, we just ask that you will bless our efforts in this church, Lord, that we will be a redeeming church. We won't be a disciplinarian church, Lord. That should never come up. That shouldn't be the aim of any church, Lord, but that we would be a redeeming church, that we would only draw people to you, that we'd go into the community and help people know you and who you are, Lord. And if an issue comes up with a brother or sister, Lord, help us to have a heart of compassion as you do. Lord, remind us of how priceless that individual is, even in their darkest moments, Lord, that you yourself died to save them and help us to treat them as you would in that situation, Lord. And yes, maybe some action from the church may be required, Father, but only in the interest of that individual, Father. And we pray that you will help us resolve our conflicts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn is...